Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. pleasure to be here, in part because this is a physics series, and I'm a paleontologist, a paleoanthropologist, but my dad is a physicist, so he was thrilled to hear that I was giving a talk in this <laughs> seminar series. So I'm going to talk about hominoids today, specifically hominoid evolution, and probably one of the first questions you might have is, what is a hominoid? Well, hominoids are the group of primates to which we belong along with all of the apes. So it's a classification of primates that includes us along with our closest relatives. And hominoids first show up in the fossil record about 20 million years ago. And typically when you first start to sample a group in the fossil record, what you find is that the early members of the group tend to be more generalized than later members that tend to become more specialized. What you also tend to find is that you start out with lower diversity, with only one or a few representatives of that group, and then later on in evolutionary time, you end up with more and more species. And what I want to talk to you today um, about is that one of the interesting things that seems to be emerging as we uh, look at this time period around 20 million years ago is that apes um, look like they're actually more specialized and more diverse than we initially anticipated. And I want to talk a little bit about that diversity, that specialization, and then also what might be going on. So I'm going to talk about uh, fossil sites that are in East Africa that are around 20 million years old. And as I said, this is where we first start to sample hominoids or apes in the fossil record. And it's also where we start to sample apes' closest relatives, which are the old world monkeys. And so here are some pictures of some apes up here. There's an orangutan, gorilla, gibbon, a bonobo. And then here are some old world monkeys like, like baboons and leaf monkeys over here. And if we look at this diagram, this shows the, the a tree that shows the relationships, the evolutionary relationships among living hominoids. And so you can see here, humans are kind of clustered in here along with um, the great African apes like chimpanzees and gorillas. Here are orangutans, here are gibbons. So again, these are all the living hominoids of which we are a member. And then if we kind of go back back along the tree, we'll see that hominoids once shared an ancestor with old world monkeys, or what we call cercopithecoids. And that would be somewhere before 20 million years ago, maybe going back 25 or 30 million years ago, apes and monkeys would have shared a common ancestor. Now, in order to be able to recognize, let's say, a hominoid or an ape in the fossil record, we have to know what features to look for, what's going to distinguish them from, let's say, a monkey. And one thing we can do is we can look at living apes and living monkeys and see what distinguishes them to give us some clues of what to look for in the fossil record. And this is a partial list of features that distinguish the hominoids, or the apes, from uh, monkeys. So for example, hominoids tend to be large-bodied. Just think of a gorilla, think of a chimp, bigger than most monkeys. And to go along with that, they have relatively large brains for their body size. And um, in addition, they also tend to live longer and take longer to grow up. And these three factors are probably very tightly correlated. But, um, you know, size we can get at, we can actually get at maturation rates from looking at things like enamel and how, and how it forms. Um, but some other features we can look at in fossils have to do with actual features in the skeleton that preserve in the skeleton. For example, all these next five features have to do with the head. Um, and you might, as you're reading them, you might think these are kind of subtle things, and you're not wrong in thinking that. They are kind of subtle, the features that are distinctive to hominoids in the head, at least. Um, they tend to have lower molars, so your chewing teeth in the back, your, your cheek teeth. Um, they, they have five cusps in apes, whereas they're going to have four cusps in monkeys. Um, the upper molars tend to be kind of square rather than rectangular. There's a, like a pocket, uh, what we call a sinus, in the front of the head. 
The, the palate and the nose tend to be kind of broad. And then if we look at the nasal bone, sort of this region here between your, between your two eye orbits, if you look at that in cross section, it's kind of flat rather than curved. So that doesn't seem like all, you know, a lot of really you know, compelling features that we're gonna be able to um, um, use to really characterize hominoids. And that's because it turns out for hominoids, what's really distinctive about them is actually below the neck in the rest of the body. And the features that really distinguish hominoids, at least in terms of the skeletal system, are features related to their locomotion. Because apes do some really different things compared to most primates in terms of their locomotion. For one thing, apes are upright most of the time, or not most of the time, but much of the time. Humans, of course, are upright all the time. But, but taxa like gibbons, like orangutans, a lot of the time when they're climbing in trees, their torsos are upright. And the term we use to describe having an upright torso is this term right here, orthograde. And then the other thing that apes do a lot is they hang below branches rather than walk on top of branches like a monkey tends to do. And we call that suspension. So if you use your hands or your feet to hang below a branch, that's called uh, suspensory behavior. And now if I want to list anatomical features that are related to being upright, being suspensory, now we come up with a lot of features. So rather than just a, a small handful of features like we could isolate in the head, we've now got a whole list of features. And I've kind of clustered them together according to um, what the features relate to functionally, but for instance, there are features related to having an upright torso. So one way you can do that is basically by shortening the trunk. It makes it easier to stabilize. There are features related to having a, um, a straight elbow. So if you look at this gibbon over here, notice how when it's hanging, it's got that straight elbow. So there are bony features of the humerus, of the ulna that allow an ape to straighten its elbow fully so it can hang by its hands, whereas a monkey has trouble doing that. Um, and this, incidentally, over here, this is an orangutan. So you can see that there's a number of different functional complexes, a number of anatomical features related to um, basically what's a really dramatic locomotor innovation among primates, being suspensory and also being upright a lot of the time. And we think that these features are linked and that what they do is they allow hominoids to exploit a niche that other primates and indeed other mammals aren't as successful at exploiting. And because uh, uh, taxa like orangutans are suspensory and so good at being suspensory, so for example, an orangutan has great mobility in its hips and also in its shoulders, and they have really long curved fingers. And what that does is it allows them to be suspensory, but one of the great things about suspension is, is it allows you to distribute your body weight across multiple supports, like this orangutan is doing. So rather than being constrained to walk on top of a branch the way that a monkey does, an orangutan or a chimp or smaller gorillas can actually distribute their body weight over multiple supports. And that means that they can get to the periphery of the crown of a tree where smaller supports are gonna to tend to be found. In the center of a tree are gonna be big branches. As you move to the periphery, they're gonna be smaller branches. Now why would you wanna to move to the periphery? Because that's where all the ripe fruit is. It's also where the young leaves are gonna to tend to be. So the nicest arboreal foodstuffs are gonna be more at the edge of the tree. And so what has been proposed is that these adaptations for um, mobility, for hanging, for climbing, and over here we're looking at, at, a, at a bonobo, which is closely related to a chimpanzee, vertically climbing a tree. So you can see it's upright when it's doing it. And it's, it's also using mobility in, it, in, its, in its hip and knee and shoulder in order to, in order to climb that tree trunk. Um, these adaptations allow apes to exploit arboreal resources like ripe fruit at a very large body size. So an orangutan male, for example, spends almost all of its time in the trees, yet it's 80 kilos. It's huge. Um, and it can do that because of these locomotor adaptations. So it really allows apes to do something we don't see other mammals being able to do. Now for a long time, the earliest fossil apes that we found in the fossil record looked rather like this, which 
at first blush kind of looks like a monkey, doesn't it? It's walking around on all fours. Its back isn't upright. Its back is horizontal. And that condition in which the back is horizontal rather than upright we call pronograde. So you might hear me use these terms kind of in opposition. Pronograde, having a horizontal trunk, versus orthograde, having an upright trunk. And so this is proconsul, so this is the genus name of one of the oldest hominoids we know of from East Africa. And for many years, this was, this was sort of how apes were thought to start out. They started out being above branch, and over time, slowly developed adaptations for hanging below branches and for being upright. And one of the things that makes people suspect that this is a hominoid are some of these subtle features of the, of the teeth and of the skull that I mentioned before. It's also thought to have lacked a tail, and that's a feature we see in all living hominoids, that there's no tail. Um, and it's also fairly large, so chimpanzee size for some of the species of this taxon. So it has at least some, although not many, of the attributes we associate with living hominoids. So what I'm going to do is, is talk now about some of the f fossils that are coming out of, out of these different East African sites, um, talk about what hom hominoids are present. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of research because I think it's kind of interesting to know the chronology of when fossils are found because as you'll see, our, our, hy our hypotheses about how evolution has proceeded really change with new information. Um, I'm going to talk about the adaptations of these hominoids. In particular, I'm going to talk about locomotor adaptations like I've already been doing, but I'm also going to talk about diet. And then I'm going to uh, talk about the evolutionary significance. And this, incidentally, is just a, a, a shot of uh, one of the places where I work in, in Uganda. So the fossil sites are actually up here. And we get, we get a lot of interest from the local kids when we're, we're out there digging. That's, that's who's in the foreground there. So the sites are in the um, East African Rift. So you're probably aware there's a lot of tectonic activity has been going on for millions of years. In fact, 20 million years ago, there was a lot of tectonic activity that resulted in um, the formation of volcanoes. And many of the fossils I'm going to talk about today are actually found on the flanks of now extinct volcanoes. So the volcanoes um, sort of set up conditions that favored fossil preservation. So the eruption of ash, for example, um, helped to preserve the fossil and then there are layers of lava that are interspersed with the sedimentary layers where the fossils are found that we can radiometrically date to come up with really nice ages for these sites. So well, that's one of the nice things about working in the rift is because there's been a lot of volcanic activity, you can precisely date your fossils. And that's not true worldwide. We're really lucky, those, those, those of us who work in this area. So in this map, this is sort of the rift down here. This is Lake Victoria. Here's Lake Turkana up here. And there's sort of three clusters of fossil sites where we find early hominoids. We find them here near Lake Victoria, associated with two volcanic complexes. And this is where most of the proconsul fossils come from. But we also find some proconsul fossils from this site. This is one of the sites where I work in Uganda called Napak. So we know proconsul from both Kenya and Uganda. Then we know a taxon that I'm going to call Morotopithecus because it's found on the flanks of a volcano called Moroto. So we call it Morotopithecus, which means the ape from Moroto. Um, it's found at this locality. And then over here in Kenya, this is back in Kenya over here, we also find some fossils along the shores of Lake Turkana. And the taxon from these sites is called Afropithecus. So it basically means the African ape. And as I mentioned, we have good dates for all of these sites. The oldest sites are from Uganda, a little more than 20 million years, about 21 million years. Um, here at these sites in Lake Victoria, we're talking about sites that are around 19 million years. And then these sites here are between 17 and 18 million years. So that's the time range we're, we're sampling. Um, we have up to three different genera. And we're spanning, again, sort of 18, 19, 20 million years in terms of age. I just want to say a few words about the history of work, at least in Uganda, where, where I do most of my field work. And that's because people often ask, you know, how do you know where to go to look for fossils? And in my case, I was lucky. When I was a graduate student, I um, was looking for a, a project to start on my own rather than always working on other people's projects. And I knew that a lot of work had been done in the 1960s at some fossil sites in Uganda. And this is actually a photograph 
that a colleague kindly gave to me showing excavations taking place at the Napak locality in Uganda. And so this is circa um, the early, early 1960s. And the researcher that was doing work here was a um, uh, paleontologist by the name of William Bishop. And so he worked at these sites in Uganda, at Napak and Moroto, and he did um, really nice stratigraphic work. So he worked out the, the section for the sites, all the different fossiliferous layers with the interspersing lavas. And he found some really interesting fossils through his research. One of the things he found was this upper jaw and partial face of an ape. And at the time, that was radiometrically dated to be about 14 million years. And you can see that this is pretty complete. Now, when this was first found, about the only ape named from this time interval was proconsul. So this fossil was thought to be proconsul. And in addition to this face, and this is a really, whoops, this is a really complete specimen. You can see that both tooth rows are present, the nose is present, there's a little bit of the, sort of the area above the nose, enough to know how widely spaced the eyes are. So there's a lot of features you can get from this completed specimen. And I'll actually show some casts of this specimen and a few other specimens at the, at the end of my talk today. But there's a lot of information in a specimen that, that, that is that complete. In addition to that face, they also found um, a series of vertebra, of which this is the most complete. And at the time, the vertebra didn't receive a lot of attention. Um, but this is the fossil vertebra from Moroto, shown right here. And it didn't receive a lot of attention because it was kind of what people expected to find at the time. That is, its features looked rather like those of living hominoids. In particular, people could interpret the functional anatomy of this vertebra and say, oh yeah, this is a vertebra from an animal that would have had an upright trunk part of the time. So for example, you can look at the position of processes on a bone like this. These processes that stick out to the side are called the transverse processes. So this is what we call the body of the vertebra. These are the transverse processes that kind of stick out to the side. And then up here on the top of the vertebra um, is the spinous process. And that's the process you feel in your own back. If you kind of run your fingers along your back, you feel bumps sticking out along your back. That's the spine, the spine of the vertebra sticking out. But one thing researchers noticed is that the position of this spine was very high on the vertebra. And that serves to increase the mechanical advantage of muscles in your back that keep you upright. If you look at monkey vertebra, that, that process is positioned down lower. And if we look over here, this is a, a, a vertebra that's more typical of what we would call a pronograde animal, an animal that walks around with a horizontal trunk. It doesn't have a process that's positioned high up, therefore its muscles are not as mechanically efficient at maintaining an upright posture. And when, as I mentioned, when this was found, it was kind of what people expected to find. But then as researchers continued to find more fossils in places like Kenya in the 80s, in the 90s, it turned out that no other early apes had an anatomy like this. And once vertebra were found for proconsul in Kenya, it was shown that proconsul actually had vertebra that looked like those of monkeys that are compatible with being pronograde, not with being orthograde. And so once this occurred, it was, it was, it was recognized that this thing from Moroto couldn't be uh, considered to be proconsul anymore. It would have had to be a separate kind of animal since its anatomy in the body was so different. But no one really knew what to do with it. It was kind of, that was kind of the climate at the time when I first went to Moroto, and the idea was to try and find some more fossils to see if we could better understand what the adaptations of this hominoid were. And I was really lucky in that first field season in that um, the, the, the team uh, that I was working with and I, we actually found more ape fossils. We found, for example, the right and left femur, or thigh bone, of a hominoid. And this is the right femur, which is more complete, shown from the front and also shown from the back. So the femur on the left is the front view and the femur on the right is the back view. And this is what the fossil site looked like. And I actually snapped this picture, um, it would have been 1994, so a long time ago when I first went to Moroto, but I actually snapped this picture from the top of a hill. We were, we were prospecting for the locality because we didn't have maps of where the locality was. We just knew generally where it was, so we were prospecting. And from the top of the hill, we looked down, 
And we sort of thought, ah, those look like sediments. Let's go down there. And this was, in fact, the locality. And this is, you know, within an hour of taking this picture, we'd found the ephemera. But that's, it's kind of nostalgic for me to see that picture, because I think, oh, yeah. When it, we were looking down from the top of the hill, we, we saw the site right away. And this is just a close-up of the top part of the femur. So what we do as paleontologists, we look at the details of the anatomy, like I sort of talked to you about the vertebra, and we try and reconstruct what the functional potential would be for that given region. So we can look at the top part of the femur and try and reconstruct what its hip mobility would have been like. And one thing we notice if we look at a living ape femur, the top part or the hip end of the femur, is that they tend to have really big femoral heads that are um, elevated above the level of this bony projection over here, which is called the greater trochanter. And by having a big head that's kind of elevated, that improves the range of abduction or mobility of the hip. So you could appreciate if you started to abduct your hip or move it out to the side, if this bony projection is lower than the head, you're going to be able to abduct it further. And if we look at something like a monkey, it's got a really prominent projection and therefore has less mobility in the hip. And what we noticed when we looked at Morotopithecus is it's kind of intermediate between a living ape, which has got a really mobile hip, and a living monkey, which has more moderate mobility. So for, for this taxon, again, this is the ape from Moroto. As I mentioned, um, we, today we call it Morotopithecus. When we first found this fossil, it didn't have a name yet. But um, looks like its, its hip mobility was kind of intermediate to um, living apes and living monkeys. The, the femur, as you can see, was broken, and that allows us to look at the cross-sectional geometry of the shaft. And one thing that was really striking about the shaft when we looked at it was that the cortical bone, or the bone making up the shaft of the femur, was really thick. And that's extremely rare among primates. You don't see thick, thick bone like this in many species. And the species where you do see it are in orangutans and in another kind of primate called a loris, which practices very slow, careful climbing. And what, what um, uh, primatologists have speculated is that this very thick bone will only be deposited when you have sustained muscular contractions for long periods of time. So basically, your muscles are contracting for a long, long time, and that actually loads the bone along its long axis. And the primates that do that are the ones that do this very careful, slow climbing. And orangutans do this a lot, too, where they're carefully placing their foot um, on a particular branch, and then they have to maintain that posture for a while while they move to the next position, or they might have to sustain that position while they're feeding. And this tends to load the lower limb to a very high degree. So the fact that this bone is so thick in the femur suggests maybe it's doing something like what orangutans do today or what lorises do today, where they do this very slow, deliberate climbing. We also looked at the end of the femur, that's the knee end of the femur, what we call the distal femur. And um, apes tend to have very wide or broad knees, and that kind of helps them in terms of climbing ad uh, adaptations when their um, knees are way out to the side rather than directly under their body. Especially, they tend to have a pretty broad um, uh, medial um, condyle in their femur, whereas monkeys, it's narrower and more symmetrical in terms of the, of the shape of the femur. And what we found for this, for this old ape was that it had this very broad, kind of asymmetrical femur like we see in, in apes. And then just one more femoral feature I'll mention is that if we look at the side of the end of the femur, so now we're looking at the side of the femur, it's actually the lateral aspect of the femur, so the outside of your knee. There's a groove for a tendon of a muscle called the popliteus. And that's a little muscle that kind of wraps around the back of your knee. So this is actually just a picture of a human knee that shows the popliteus muscle. So this weird little muscle that starts on the side of your femur and wraps around and inserts in the back of your tibia. And in a human, this knee doesn't do much. Uh, sorry, this knee. <laughs> this muscle doesn't do much. If you crouch and then stand up, it helps to kind of stabilize the knee so you don't dislocate your knee when you do something weird like that. And in something like a monkey, it also is rarely active. If a monkey's running along and then abruptly change, changes direction, the muscle will fire. But in a hominoid, this muscle is active a lot. And this is known actually through what's called electromyography, where you actually put little um, um, needles in muscles of animals. So you can measure the electrical activity of the muscles, um, little probes, and figure out when the muscles are actually firing. <coughs> 
It turns out apoplateus muscles are active in a whole variety of climbing behaviors. The muscles tend to be big and the muscles tend to leave a deep groove at the side of the bone. And the femur from Maroto has that deep groove like living apes do. And one of the climbing behaviors where the popliteus seems to be active is in what's called vertical climbing. So here is that picture of the bonobo again, climbing up a vertical trunk. And as it does so, it puts its feet against, you can try and do this at home, it's hard. Imagine putting the soles of your feet against the trunk of the tree and then you have to climb that way. It requires a lot of mobility in the hip and knee. But it also requires some stabilizing mechanism so that your knee doesn't become dislocated when it's sticking way out to the side. And that's where the popliteus comes in. So having a well-developed popliteus we think is a marker of having, uh, doing these kinds of behaviors. So those are some of the things we gleaned from looking at the femora that we found. Um, we also found at a nearby site, uh, also on the flanks of the Moroto volcano, we actually call the sites Moroto 1 and Moroto 2. So Moroto 2 is the site where the jaw, the vertebra, and the femora are found. This is Moroto 1. And we found a little bit of a scapula, or shoulder blade, shoulder bone. Um, at Moroto 1. And the part of the scapula that we found is this part right here, and this might look to you pretty insignificant, not a very exciting fossil, but this is actually a functionally really informative part of the scapula. This is the shoulder socket, or what we call the glenoid fossa. And this is the part of the scapula that articulates with the head of the humerus. So it's the socket part of the ball and socket joint that makes up your, your shoulder joint. So what we can do is we can look at the shape of this joint and see if we can infer something about shoulder mobility. And there are a couple things we can do, and this is just an, a sort of another sketch of the, of the fossil scapula shown here between a chimpanzee scapula and a baboon scapula. Remember the chimp is the ape and it's got a really mobile shoulder and a baboon is a monkey and it's got a much less mo mobile shoulder. One of the things we can do is look at how that joint is curved because that might give us some information about how the shoulder moves in uh, a living animal. And so I actually did a really simple metric in order to figure out how to sort of distinguish between the shapes of different shoulder joints. What I did is I measured the depth of the, the glenoid fossa or the shoulder socket and divided it by the length of the socket from top to bottom. And so that basically is just a way to assess how deeply curved the, the socket is along that axis from top to bottom. And I also did it from side to side, what we call the dorsoventral axis. So I did the same thing. How deep is the, um, is the, is the fossa for its width? And a higher number would mean that the depth is greater, so it's more deeply curved, and a lower number would mean it's a shallow, um, a more shallow socket along this axis. And one thing that we find about monkeys, and all these letters up here um, distinguish different monkeys. So for example, A is a macaque, and what's D? D is a mandrel, which is kind of like a, a, kind of like a baboon. They all have highly curved glenoid fossa or shoulder sockets from top to bottom, but they're relatively flat from side to side. And so what that means is that their shoulder socket is kind of C-shaped with a lot of curvature from top to bottom, but not a lot from side to side. And that's really good if most of what you're doing, and if you sort of think about a monkey with its shoulder sockets, and they're actually gonna face ventrally like this in a monkey, if its shoulder socket is curved like that, that's gonna be great for rotating your humerus back and forth, back and forth, if most of what you're doing is flexion and extension. And that's most of what a monkey does. Mostly a monkey is walking and running, and its arms are moving in this plane. So that's a great kind of shape if that's most of what you're doing. What we see with apes, though, is a different pattern of curvature where there's moderate curvature from top to bottom and also moderate curvature from side to side. So it's a more symmetrical cup-shaped socket. And that's going to be good if you're moving your arm along any plane. So not just fore and aft, but side to side and diagonally. Basically means that your humerus is, can move in any direction. So what we see then with apes is that they tend to have a cup-shaped um, fossa, 
and monkeys tend to have a more C-shaped fossa, and we think that's related to the kinds of movements that they typically do. And this M here is Merodopithecus, so telling us it has a cup-shaped fossa. The other thing that we can look at that's a shape difference between apes over here on the right and monkeys over here on the left is that apes tend to have much broader fossa. Again, this, I'm using fossa as a kind of a shorthand for the socket, the shoulder socket. Um, I tend to have much broader sockets than do monkeys, especially around the middle. And sometimes the, this shape of a socket is called an oval as opposed to a pear shape, which is what we see in a monkey. And again, that's something that we can quantify in a pretty simple way using, using a ratio. And here what I did is I just measured the width of the fossa at 1 8 increments along the length and then divided it by the length. So basically what you get over here then is a sort of a profile that tells you how wide the fossa is that controls for the size of the, the fossa. And what I found was that apes have much broader fossa, these are all apes over here, than monkeys, and the monkeys tend to cluster together in these pear-shaped or more narrow fossa. And so what this, what this metric is telling us is that apes have wider um, joint surfaces, and typically where we see widening of the joint surface is basically to sustain a load that occurs in that area. So apes aren't just loading their arms from top to bottom, they're loading their arms from side to side too, because of this great shoulder mobility that they need for suspensory kinds of behavior, including you know, hanging and moving by the arms, which we call brachiation. So we see real differences then in the shoulder joint of more mobile primates and less mobile primates. And this glenoid fossa certainly looks like um, the, uh, much more like the fossa that we find or the shoulder sockets that we find in apes that have mobile shoulder joints. So those were two of the things that we did when we went to Uganda. We found these fossils, but we also redated the sites using modern radiometric techniques, single crystal argon argon dating. And I actually should have thought to develop this part of my lecture since this is, this is the only part that kind of strays into physics, <laughs> radiometric dating, but I didn't think to make any slides for it. But I will say that we dated capping lavas that were on top of the fossiliferous localities at both of these sites, and we found that they were a little over 20 million years old. So because the lava on top of the fossils is 20 million years old. That tells us the fossils are older than that. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a lava underneath that can constrain the age between two radiometric dates, but we at the very least know that these fossils are older than 20 million years. And remember, when Bill Bishop was working here, his potassium argon dates suggested 14 million years. So all of a sudden, we've pushed back the age of these fossils considerably. So. Um, in total, what we did with this, with this material once we found it, and we first started publishing this in the early part of, I guess, uh, um, 2000 is kind of when we, we sort of published everything all together. We named this taxon. Um, we said we can distinguish it from proconsul now. We dated it and said, hey, it's a lot older than we thought. Furthermore, not only is this material older, but Features like having a stable lower back, like having adaptations for vertical climbing and high shoulder mobility, these features are actually around 20 million years ago. And prior to this um, discovery, the oldest apes that had these features were actually found in Europe and were considerably younger, more in the order of 12 million years ago. So we were able to show that these adaptations arose much earlier than had previously been thought. And this is a, a, a reconstruction that um, um, Steve Nash, a, a colleague of mine at um, SUNY Stony Brook did a, uh, a number of years ago, but it's, it's kind of neat. And again, this is, this, is, this is a whole body reconstruction, but the parts we have are a little bit of the shoulder, a little bit of the leg, a little bit of the back, and a little bit of the face. That's what we actually have, and the rest is imaginative. Now we can kind of contrast this with Proconsul, who's around at the same time, but looks really different in terms of its overall body plan. It's got much more limited mobility in its proximal joints, doesn't have the heavy loading in the femur, and has a more flexible back, not the, the, the stable lower back that we see in Merodopithecus. So we can easily now distinguish between Merodopithecus and Proconsul. 
we can't distinguish them um, with a lot of really distinctive features in the head, though. The features that distinguish them in the head are pretty subtle. Um, you know, things like there's slight differences in their tooth proportions, um, uh, and um, you know, the, the region between the eyes is a little narrower. <laughs> so pretty subtle features in the head, but much more dramatic features of the postcranium does distinguish them. So as I mentioned, that higher point of origin of those transverse processes on the vertebra, thicker femoral bone, and a more mobile shoulder joint. Now, one ape I haven't talked about much yet is Afropithecus. And I want to spend some time now talking about Afropithecus because the status of Merodopithecus and Afropithecus is somewhat controversial in the literature. And part of the reason it's a little bit controversial is because Afropithecus is well known craniodentally. There's a beautiful partial skull, and there's a lot of isolated uh, jaw fragments that are found for it. But we don't have much postcrania. In fact, we don't have any overlapping elements between Afropithecus and Merodopithecus. So we can't directly compare vertebra the way we can when we compare Merodopithecus and Proconsul. Moreover, um, Afropithecus and Merodopithecus share a lot of features of the head, just the way that Proconsul and Merodopithecus share a lot of features of the skull and of the head. And when we initially published Merodopithecus, we made a list of features that we said distinguished them. So for example, Merodopithecus has a broader nasal aperture. And if I, if I this, these are side views here of Afropithecus and Merodopithecus. And probably if you're looking at these, you would kind of think, eh, they look similar to me. And they do kind of look similar in terms of proportions, in terms of the fact they have long snouts and great big canines. They do look similar. If we look at this picture of the actual fossils, from the front, you can see some of these features I mentioned, like you know the nose is broader in Merodopithecus than Afropithecus. But as a whole, they're not super compelling. And one might question, you know, are Merodopithecus and Afropithecus are they really distinct at the genus level, or could they just be different species? How do we know um, how distinct they are? And um, one of the reasons that we're challenged, I think, in doing this, when we've got you know, two really complete upper jaws from two different places, we should be able to figure out if the same kind of animal or not. Well, I think one of the problems is that um, cranial anatomy is very similar, for the most part, among these early apes. And what we're doing here is we're comparing two male upper jaws. There are a lot of features they share. And if we were to throw a, a big male proconsul upper jaw into the mix, we'd find it looked really similar, too. So cranial anatomy hasn't changed much since Proconsul and Afropithecus and Merodopithecus shared a common ancestor. They still retain a lot of features, what we call primitive features. They haven't specialized that much in terms of features like you know, having this really long projecting snout. So Afropithecus and Merodopithecus don't have postcrania in common. You know, what can we do then in order to really figure out how closely related they are, even if they might be the same genus? And the way in which we sort of approach the genus question in paleontology is to attempt to establish whether or not we think fossil taxa would have had a different niche. And by niche, I mean, what's the way of life of the animal? How does it make its living? How does it move about? What does it eat? Where does it live? What sort of animal was it like? And for fossils, the two areas that we can really kind of do some detailed reconstructions are in diet, what did it eat? And then also in locomotion, as I've already discussed in the case of Merodopithecus, we can say some pretty detailed things about its overall locomotor pattern based on its fossils. So, as I mentioned, Afropithecus, Merodopithecus, we don't have overlapping postcrania. What can we do? Well, maybe what we can do is look in a little more detail at the diet. And um, one of the ways in which um, we're now able to do that is recently we found a new jaw from Merodo. So not only can we look at the upper jaw of Merodopithecus, but we can also look at the lower jaw of Merodopithecus too. And um, this is a uh, a mandible now that I want to talk about in, in some 
um, detail. And you can see that it's just a partial specimen. This is sort of a more typical fossil that we might find. The, the palate, the jaw is really beautiful, really complete. This is kind of more typical of what we find where, you know, we got part of the right half of the jaw, but the teeth are kind of lopped off. And on the left side, um, most of the teeth are missing, but one of the molars is perfect, perfectly preserved. And this molar actually has a lot of information about diet. So this is this, this new mandible. And one of the things we did is we sort of thought, looks proportionally like it could go with the upper jaw. And it actually does kind of fit in terms of occlusion between these two teeth. However, they're almost certainly not the same individual. And the reason I say that is because this individual has small canines and is probably a female. And this individual, uh, the, the palate I showed you before, has great big canines and was a male. But in terms of the proportions of the upper and lower teeth, they do kind of fit together nicely as this, as this um, picture shows. Now, because in this lower jaw, there's one really nice tooth, and we call that tooth the M2. It's the second molar in the tooth row, and you probably know you've got three molars, three of those uh, five cusped teeth along the right and left half of both the upper and lower jaws. This is the second one, or the one in the middle. And um, we can look at the shape of the molar um, in order to get some information about diet, because it turns out that animals that eat a lot of leaves in their diet, as opposed to fruit, and most primates, at least most apes, are going to have some combination of fruit and leaves, maybe seeds, um, uh, and other plant material in their diet. Um, what primates that eat a lot of leaves tend to do is they tend to elongate their molars from front to back. And that kind of tends to stretch out the crests in their teeth that are important for slicing up leaves. So in general, if we look at sort of the topography of the tooth of an animal that's interested in crushing fruit, it'll tend to have kind of low rounded cusps and basins that it uses to crush the fruit. Whereas uh, what we call a folivore or a a primate that likes to eat leaves will tend to have crests or ridges between its teeth that are nice for slicing up leaves. And part of what folivores also do, is, as I mentioned, is they have, tend to have longer teeth from front to back. So what this graph is, is just shows you some data for the overall proportions of the lower M2, or that lower second molar. On this axis here, um, so in the y-axis, it's the breadth of the tooth divided by the length times 100. So values of 100 would be square teeth, and values that are low down here would be long teeth, so kind of rectangular. And on the x-axis, it's breadth times length, or just the area of the tooth. That's basically just a, a way to say how big is that tooth. What you can see is a whole bunch of different primates kind of scattered up here. <laughs> And so you can see this axis is just size range. Incidentally, the yellow and, and fuchsia colored dots are gorillas. Um, where are chimpanzees? The, 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 the turquoisey color, no, sorry, where is pan? OK, the blue triangle and the open circle, those are chimpanzees. So just kind of give you an idea. If you're modern chimps, they're more frugivorous or more fruit eating. They have square teeth. And they're also smaller. And gorillas are more folivorous or they eat more leaves. They're, they're, they have bigger teeth, but also longer teeth. Um, these gray triangles over here are a highly folivorous fossil um, primate called Rangwapithecus that has really long teeth and really crusty teeth and all kinds of scratches on its enamel that shows that it ate leaves because leaves, because of the silicon leaves, tend to leave scratches on the tooth enamel. So it's a very distinctive property of, of leaf-eating primates to have scratched up teeth. So this taxon has long teeth and crusty teeth and scratched up teeth, and here's that molar from the Maroto jaw, it's also got very long teeth. Now, it's big, sort of in the size range of gorilla, but it's elongated. So that's one thing that kind of suggests to us it's a little different. And if we look here, where is Afropithecus? Is the red? Afropithecus, those teeth aren't as big, and they're also not as elongated. And where's proconsul? So here's, here's one proconsul here. These brown are also proconsul. So the proconsul taxa, not only are they smaller, remember, here's Merodopithecus over here. Not only are they smaller, but the teeth are squarer. Merodopithecus has got a bigger molar, and it's also a longer molar. Now, several years ago, um, 
Rich Kay and Peter Unger, who are two anthropologists, developed an index that you can use to try and reconstruct the amount of filivery in the diet of a fossil primate. And what they did is they measured the length of the crests in the tooth. And if we look over here at this little picture of a filivorous primate, this is actually a monkey, what you can do is you can measure the lengths of all the different little crests in the tooth. And what they do is they plot they, in a log-log plot, they plot the lengths of, the, of all the crests against the length of the tooth itself to see how crusty the tooth is for its length. And they did this for all living apes. And then what they um, noticed is they found that those primates that are more folivorous or that eat more leaves tend to have more crests for the length of their tooth than do those that are frugivorous. And this is the regression line that they got, which is a really high R squared value, but it also, would, um, um, the way they sort of assessed filivory is to plot the residuals of the amount of um, offset for each taxon from the regression line, and then they just show the residual values over here. So these are all living primates that we know their diet. So here are chimps and bonobos down here. Here are a bunch of gibbons. Here's orangs. Here are gorillas, and this is a siamang, which is a large-bodied gibbon. And the more filivorous primates are up here. They're the ones that have crestier teeth or that are basically higher off, uh, have a higher uh, value, um, higher residual. And they did that for a number of fossil primates too. And what they found is that in general, fossil primates or fossil, uh, early fossil apes don't have teeth that have as many crests or as well-developed crests as living primates do, but we still see a kind of a range of values. So here are the crusty teeth up here that are folivorous, and here are the less crusty teeth that are more frugivorous or, or, or eating fruit. So these are the living primates here, and then this is the data they got for fossil primates. Now when this was published, there wasn't a good tooth for either Merodopithecus or Afropithecus so that they could be plotted here among the fossil primates. And I apologize, this is kind of small, but here's Proconsul right here, kind of um, in the middle of among living primates, but more in the low end. Oh, actually, here's another Proconsul down here. Proconsul tend to have not very crusty teeth at all. So they look much more frugivorous. Now, if we put um, Merodopithecus and Afropithecus in, because now Afropithecus and Merodopithecus both have nice M2s that we can measure all the crests, we see that Afropithecus is way down here with not having nice crest development at all, and Merodopithecus is way up here with having um, uh, very good crest development. So now we can kind of characterize some of these differences in the tooth shape of Proconsul, Merodopithecus, and Afropithecus. And even though you might think, aren't those kind of subtle, they're all features that are really important in terms of being able to reconstruct diet. So Merodopithecus has a rectangular molar. It's elongated. The teeth are kind of high, so the crests are well-developed um, in terms of height, and then they're also well-developed in terms of length. The molar enamel is also thin, and that's something we tend to see in folivorous primates too, the coating on the outside of the teeth isn't particularly thick. And we can compare that to Proconsul over here, which has you know, a, more, a more square-shaped tooth with low crowns, not good crests, um, and uh, overall a diet that we would think it's, it's probably eating soft fruit. In contrast, Afropithecus has, uh, also has square teeth that are very low crowned, has very poor development of crests, and it's got really thick, thick enamel. And it has some other features that suggest it was a hard fruit eater. And some of the other features that suggest it was a hard fruit eater are the fact that it has heavily worn canines and incisors. Um, so that if you look at Afropithecus teeth, not only are the teeth coated with really thick enamel so that they won't break when they're subjecting food to really high loads, but the anterior teeth are getting really worn. And what researchers have said have, as they've looked at sort of the overall dentition of Afropithecus is that it was a hard fruit specialist. So its anterior teeth were used to process really tough, probably husked fruit. And um, because of that, its incisors and canines get heavily worn. And so this is an example of a canine of Afropithecus where you can see this isn't from 
breakage, this is actual wear on the tooth. So it's being, you know, it's exerting very high forces on hard food items in order to generate that kind of wear. And this is the tip of a, of a canine also showing some wear. So what Afropithecus seems to be doing is it's processing hard food with its anterior teeth and then it's chewing them with its back teeth and it's got that thick enamel and the low rounded cusps so that it can process that hard food without the teeth um, breaking and so the, also so the teeth will last a long time because they have that thick enamel on them. Rhodopithecus doesn't have thick enamel. Moreover, when we look at the canines, we see that the tips are pristine, that they don't have that wear. So this is the tip of actually the, that palette that I showed you. The, this is the tip of one canine, and here's another individual. Again, the tip doesn't show that wear. And what's kind of interesting to note is that the back teeth of this specimen are heavily worn. So it's not like it was really young and that's why the canine's not worn. The back teeth are worn. The M3, the M2 have deep pits um, where the enamel has worn away. Um, so clearly this was an individual who had been you know, chewing for a long time, but its canines were not damaged. And so this suggests it's eating really different things. And so this to me is really compelling evidence that even though we still can't distinguish between Afropithecus and Merodopithecus postcranially, that is we can't really say how different they were in terms of their locomotion, we can say that their diets were probably really different. One's eating hard fruit, one's incorporating probably a significant amount of leaves into its diet. And so because of that, I think we can say that we can distinguish all three of these taxa based on their niche, that we can say all three differ in diet and at least two differ in locomotion and with Afropithecus we're not sure yet because we don't have a lot of fossils as yet. So we can kind of pull now all these different lines of evidence together. We know that we have this taxon from Uganda, Merodopithecus, that's older than 20.6 million years. And it's kind of interesting now, the, the features that we have diagnosed now for this taxon. Because remember how we said early on that the typical explanation for having orthograde, suspensory behavior, advanced climbing abilities is so those apes can get to the periphery of trees, so they can get ripe fruit. And Merodopithecus is eating fruit, certainly, because, you know, all primates, almost all primates, <laughs> um, have a significant component of fruit in their diet. But, th but this primate was also, we think, eating a significant amount of leaves. So it makes us kind of rethink this idea that's been around going back to at least 1962 that hominoid adaptations are to get to the periphery of branches to access ripe fruit. So, what's, so maybe what's going on? Well, it may be that even though Merodopithecus had some ability to be you know, an agile climber, deliberate climber, and was orthograde at least part of the time, that it was not as versatile or as adept at moving on small branches as living primates are. So that um, because of this, it couldn't have traveled as far or as fast in a given day as a modern hominoid could. And um, um, because of this, even though it certainly had the capability to get to smaller branches, to access fruit and leaves, it may have needed to incorporate more leaves in its diet than many hominoids do today because of overall, maybe just not, it wasn't quite as adept or as versatile in terms of its overall locomotor pattern. And if we look at living suspensory primates, we actually maybe see some, some um, examples that that, that, that strengthen this interpretation. If we look among the gibbons, many of the gibbons are really fast and they practice what's called ricochet brachiation where they just rapidly brachiate with their two arms going all over the place. But, and these gibbons are only about five kilograms. But there's another kind of gibbon called the siamang that's a little slower, a little more ponderous and it incorporates a much larger component of leaves in its diet than do the little guys, because the little guys can travel really fast. They can get from ripe fruit patch to ripe fruit patch and cover a lot of ground in the course of a day, get all the calories and food they need. Siamang maybe needs to incorporate more leaves in its diet. And interestingly, there's a group of South American monkeys that also practice some suspensory behavior. The really active 
rapidly brachiating, um, more agile, adept member of this group is called the spider monkey. It's the most frugivorous. The woolly monkey, not quite as agile, still spensary, but it incorporates a lot more leaves in its diet too. So we can maybe see some parallels among living primates that kind of suggest that maybe this early hominoid niche was not fully exploiting um, fruit to the, to the degree which with some um, living apes can, possibly because um, it just wasn't quite as adept, as versatile, as agile with these you know, early emerging um, locomotor abilities. So overall then, um, we can say that this taxon was upright part of the time, was climbing, um, was doing some of the things we see living apes doing today that unites all the living apes in terms of these postcranial um, adaptations. That was probably eating some leaves, and I say folivore here, it was probably a frugivore slash folivore, eating both fruit and leaves. And that we can distinguish it adaptively in terms of its niche, what was it doing? We can distinguish it from other apes that are around at this time period. So if we go back now to that question we posed at the beginning, you know, what is the pattern of hominoid evolution from generalized to more specialized? Certainly the broad pattern is that <laughs> we get lots more diversity as we move, you know, to 10 and 8 and seven and six million years ago. We, get, we do get more diversity, we do get more specialization. But surprisingly, we still have a fair amount of diversity even early on in the hominoid fossil record, certainly much more than we would have thought a decade ago. And um, we might sort of ask, you know, why is it unexpected? <laughs> why is it that we have more diversity early on in terms of both locomotion and diet? And um, there are a couple of things that could be at play, one of which is, okay, we start sampling apes at 21 million years, but maybe we're actually missing earlier taxa, and that's probably the case. We don't have many sites of the appropriate age that are 24, 26, 28 million years where we have fossil primates. So we're probably missing what comes before. When we're missing that initial diversification, we're actually maybe starting to sample um, uh, a few million years into the radiation. But the other thing is that the radiation itself might be pretty rapid, that we might get a lot of diversification early on. And the only way we're going to resolve this is to understand more about the pattern of the evolution of the, of the apes is to find more fossils. So we need to find more fossils in this age. We need to find fossils that are younger. We need to find fossils that are older. So paleontologists in general have a lot of uh, work to do to fill, to fill in these gaps and just to further um, elucidate and understand um, the pattern of evolution that the apes um, underwent. Thank you.